All right. Well, welcome to the manufacturer panel. Uh, this is something I was really excited to do. You know, it, so I was like thinking, first off, we definitely want to do a developer panel. We know the developer is going to be here. But then we had a lot of manufacturers here. And, uh, and that's something that I want to talk to as well, because I think that that ultimately, you know, thinking forward, thinking about Wayne's talk yesterday and talking about making KiCad a tool that, you know, pro users use and that is, is useful for the industry, I wanted to talk to all of the manufacturers that are here as well and get their perspectives. So first off, let's kind of walk down the line and talk, who, who are you and where are you from? Uh, hi, I'm Felix. I'm from Eisler. Uh, we make electronic manufacturing uh, keep, keep, available. Keep for the mic like right in front of the face. What? Like this? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. First time here on the panel. So, uh, Well, I'm Felix from Eisler. So um, we make electronics manufacturing available or, and accessible to humans. So uh, we focus on ease of use um, and global delivery. Great. Hey, my name's Mihir. We run Royal Circuits and Advanced Assembly. We specialize in quick turn PCB fab and assembly here in the United States. Our factories are based in California and Denver. I'm Chris Denny. I work for a contract manufacturer called Wardenton Assembly, sponsor here today. Uh, but many of you may know me better from Circuit Hub, which is a partner of ours. I'm uh, Drew Festini from Osage Park. Uh, we're a manufacturer of uh, circuit boards and uh, uh, two four-layer and flex PCBs. You had you to pass them around, sorry. So I'm Amit. Uh, I work for Sierra Circuits. We employ about 400 people to manufacture and assemble circuit boards in your designs. Great. So um, starting off here, I'm kind of curious, um, what is, you know, just individually, what is your perspective on KiCad? You know, without pandering to the crowd, obviously, we, we could very easily pander to the crowd, like, KiCad, yeah! Come, oh, come on, guys. <laughs> All right, I, got that, I got that over with. Keycat? Yeah. yeah. Keycat, yeah! <laughs> you had your shot. You had your shot. Uh, so, you know, what is your perspective on the, from, you know, from the industry? Are you seeing designs come in from that? What percentage? What, what do you, uh, you know, how, how do you see this community manufacturing real things? Um, well, Keycat is definitely, I, I say, the new professional tool for electronics manufacturing. We see a lot of designs. And it certainly has made electronics manufacturing more accessible because it's an open source tool. And actually, it's the first, in my opinion, the first real electronics tool to have the open source software and open source um, uh, design file. So that makes it available anytime, anywhere, any, like you can do, open it in 20 years and it still works. This, that may have been a little bit of a pandering answer. So like percentage wise, how many, how many, uh, so like you get a hundred, hundred designs come in, how many are, are KiCad? I, I'd say, I'd say we do have about 25 to 30% KiCad. Perfect. I would say for us, because we're not directly an aggregate model, it used to be closer to like sub 1% over yeah. the last five years, and now it's gotten to over 5%. But a big trend is hardware being democratized in general. So you're seeing people develop stuff, whether or not they're a fully trained electrical engineer, and a popular tool to do that, and the thing that appeals to them is, is KiCad. So, so still one per, sub one, or? No, no, I'm saying it's grown to over, close to 5%, probably great. in okay. the last like five years. That's a huge. Yeah, that's, that's 5x jump, right, at least, so. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's like thousands of people yeah, right. at our scale, so yeah. Sure, Chris, how about you? Yeah, we see about the same numbers. I was, was gonna say somewhere around three, four, five percent. I feel like it's picked up a little bit more lately. Uh, could be 5.0, who knows, but. Uh, uh, we've been seeing a lot more uh, KiCad projects come in lately. Yeah, we, it's uh, one of the top choices for our customers, and uh, one of the things that's been great is we can use the Python API to be able to let them upload the KiCad board directly, which has been a big help. Yeah. Um, so it, it keeps on increasing over time. It's good to, good to see that. Uh, so we mainly service uh, corporate uh, customers, so please don't throw anything at me. <laughs> That's good. That's the perspective. We, like, honestly, we want to see that perspective, you know, like. So, uh, we do see KiCad uh, up and coming. Uh, you know, corporations uh, have people who use the software, like, you know, the big guys. So, I would say about 5 to 10 percent of the files we process are coming from uh, KiCad. Sure. Yeah, great, great. <laughs> if I can well, speak to that a little uh, oh. bit about corporate customers, we, we generally see KiCad being users, individual users, but we've started to see some businesses that were on legacy software that maybe got discontinued and they said rather than go to um, proprietary software, they went with KiCad and uh, they're making, making awesome stuff. Great. Can't underline that enough. That's actually a trend. 
I'm sorry? That's the trend. So there's a lot of people migrating to CatGet right now. Okay, cool. Yeah, and so uh, I guess that, that would be an interesting lead into, so maybe Ahmed, because you said you, know, you have a, a lot of corporate customers, like what, what is the barrier that did you see? I mean, do you hear users saying, well, we want to, but we can't do this, or you know, we, you know, our, you know, the, the manufacturers expect this format and, and can't have it. So, like you answered asked that question yesterday as well during the developer panel. Like, what is what is something that is a limiting factor right now for more people integrating directly with a, a CM? Uh, are you asking my opinion or? Yeah, that's literally what this all is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, in my expert opinion, uh, so uh, you know. I think that uh, there's a big problem with PCB design software in general. First of all, they cost too much. Uh, and second of all, they don't uh, acknowledge manufacturing the way it should. And I think there's a huge opportunity uh, for the designing community and the manufacturing community to come together under uh, KiCad um, and you know really fix this problem in the industry. Uh, so I think that's the number one thing that uh, will eliminate the barrier uh, is you know working together. Right. I mean, so like a personal anecdote. I had a I was working with the CM recently, and every format that they said they they listed on their website was you know ODDB plus plus or you know all these lists of you know file extensions. And I'm like, okay, not that one, not that one, not not that one. And then eventually I'm like, well, I can send you Centroids. They're like, yeah, that's fine. You know, and that's so like that's what I really mean is that on the integration piece is is there something is there some magic key that you see, well, maybe not, maybe 5% of the users are KiCad right now, but 85% are sending in this format, or, you know, 50% are, are doing this kind of thing, you know? I, uh, sorry, so I'm going to say that uh, if, if we get around uh, the open source uh, file transfer standard, IPC 2581, okay. that would unlock something huge. Um, a lot of uh, corporates like Lockheed and other people are trying to get around that. And the other uh, PCB design tools are not uh, focused hard enough on that. And if uh, you know KiCad does that, then it'll really separate itself from the rest. Right. What about automation? So I mean, a lot of you are working toward automation. You have online tools. Um, you're trying to lower the overhead. What 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 kind of tools would help to also speed up the integration from the 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 design of a board to actually getting it made? Yes, sir. Um, well, I think lots of the thing is intelligent self-service. So seeing there's tools out there that help you visualize what you upload, right? So you can actually accept uploads. I think that's in development for the last 10 years. So um, basically visualize it directly, give feedback on how the production would look like. Um, that helps users, that helps people actually adapt the data according to the manufacturer specification. Um, if, it, if the upload didn't work, well, you know, okay, you may have to adapt your files. That's actually helping you normalize things. So um, a good user interface is, I think, key to um, making things more accessible and go for self-service, and that lowers the over overhead. Mir, how about you? Yeah, if, if you have good design rules, that's like the biggest piece of automation that you can set yourself up for success with. If, if you're designing with the manufacturer's design rules in tow, you're going to be a lot more successful. And for most boards, 246 layer, it's almost a commodity at this point. You can go to most manufacturers and get a pretty reasonable, similar product of the same quality. But when you start getting into things that actually differentiate manufacturers, like blind vias, different kinds of plating processes, et cetera, that's when you want to make sure that you're using the right tolerances in your design ahead of time. That, that's what I would say is the most important. Okay. Yeah, and I would say along the same lines of that, anything you can do to double check your work, uh, anything you can do to make sure that there's not going to be any questions uh, that come up afterward or you have to go back and forth, have a conversation about things. So doing kinds of DFM checks and stuff like that. But regarding uh, uh, ODB++, uh, what we're finding now is our, our vendors, right? So we have to buy equipment and, and we have to buy software. And uh, the software that is being written today by our equipment vendors, they're, they're kind of ignoring Gerber data, right? They're, they're, they're going straight into ODB++ and these sorts of CAD export formats. So the newer equipment, the newer software is sort of requiring that. So I think that's probably why you're starting to see that requirement from EDA software is because that's, that's what our vendors are pushing on us. Um, so how do we get them on stage to yell at them? <laughs> 
I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, interesting. Maybe that's a, a good a good lead into the next thing. Too. How do you interact with your vendors? And that you know, like this is an ecosystem that starts from you know the users sitting in this audience, their brains, all the way to you know a resistor manufacturer in China or you know a packager in Malaysia or a PCB house in the Bay Area, right? Like all the way through to get a board in my hand that's assembled, there are a lot of steps in the chain. So like, what does it take to keep making that more open and more, or to reduce friction? Yeah, go, yeah. I think you just said the holy grail. Okay. So, which is, I think it's, okay. So um, if we keep uh, focusing on the open standards, I know someone's working on the IoT for uh, PCB manufacturing and assembly. If you keep uh, focusing on standards, even for manufacturing, then your manufacturing house becomes transparent, and you guys can see the steps that are going that we're going through. Uh, I think that'll be awesome. And also, I encourage everyone to get a tour of your fabricator, so you can see what is actually happening. Um, and when you're designing. You know, your job isn't done. You should own the project all the way until you get it into your hand. Um, and so I encourage you to go visit your factory. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's good. I, I second that, absolutely. Whether it's your fabricator or your assembler or if they're in the same building, go visit them, go ask them questions. Even if you don't hire them, chances are there's somebody within a couple hours drive that you can go visit and they'll probably... Uh, welcome you through the door. So take the time to take a tour, and, and most manufacturers are pretty willing to do that. Awesome. All right, uh, let's take some questions from the audience. Got one here. Hi, uh, Chris, you were talking about your software vendors beginning to phase out Gerber's. And uh, so the pit of my stomach dropped out a little bit, um, <laughs> just mildly. Uh, and although the path to 2581 is, is known, the timeline isn't. So can you say a few more words on what your vendors are telling you about how long, like, even with X2, even with Gerber X2, what, what's, the, um, you know, what's the lifespan until this becomes... Um, kind of a, a legacy product that that it will be hard to find a manufacturer to support. So it's not that, like, if you talk to the salespeople, the marketing people at our software vendors and our equipment vendors, and you ask them, do you support Gerber input? They say, absolutely. And then you buy it, and then you use it, and you find it's loaded with bugs, and there's all kinds of workarounds, and, and you have all kinds of challenges trying to use the Gerber data. But then when you have CAD data, it just everything works. And why is that? Well, it's, they've spent their software engineer's time making sure that the CAD works perfectly, uh, and the Gerber data is kind of an afterthought, you know, and uh, trying to get bug fixes for that sort of thing. I mean, it still is, I mean, every single day we're using Gerber data. We prefer Gerber data, honestly. Uh, in most circumstances, remember we're on the assembly side, not the f not so much the fab side. Um, but the, the uh, yeah, it's just you can you can tell in the quality of the product we're getting back from our software vendors. Is it, that's where I I'm seeing it. So obviously, for those of you that are doing assembly as well, you're all domestically based. I think at least for the most part. Do you have any advice for those of us who are very small time? And right now, we can only generally afford having things assembled in China because it's super cheap. I would love to have everything assembled domestically. We would too. Yeah, but the prices are just, at least right now, for high. So I mean, are there things that I can do like with my designs that would maybe alleviate that somewhat? The, so, so I'll tell you, I mean, we specialize in quick turn assembly. We're probably the largest quick turn assembler in the country today just by sheer number of unique number of parts that we produce and kind of put on boards a year. The formula for assembly is largely based on the number of unique parts on your bomb, so the number of bomb line items that you have, and then the number of boards, and then whether you have one side or two side assembly. So of those three things, probably with the most weight is the number of unique parts. And through hole. And through hole, that's right, which ties into that. So cut the through hole out, that'll save you probably the biggest amount of cost, and then try to decrease the number of unique parts. You have a bunch of different resistors, try to maybe consolidate them and do some sort of parallel series configuration in your circuit design and things like that. 
That'll probably save you the most money. And then use advanced assembly and we'll probably get you a good price. <laughs> yeah. So a question I had is about the design rules. And one of the things that frustrates me is going and trying to find those on a vendor's website. And to be honest, when I get KiCad, and it is KiCad by the way, when I get that set up properly, I'm going to use that vendor because I never want to go through that process again. So how as a manufacturer can we ease that maybe an import of uh, your manufacturing rules into KiCad so we can bring up different templates and you know put you guys on a more level playing field because I, I just won't do it every time. Yeah, well I was excited yesterday to hear from the KiCad developers that they're going to be working the DRC. So um, we would really like to be able to provide a file for our customers um, to put into KiCad like we would do with other software. So I think that'll be great once that rolls out um, in the future. Um, yeah, for now it's kind of like we can create a template or we can have screenshots, um, but I think that can be um, made a better experience for KiCad users. So, And it sounded like that's going to be happening in, in the next version, so that'll be exciting. Second that. <laughs> And you specifically had also talked a little, you had asked a question about that yesterday during the developer panel. I think we're all at the same level. Yeah, I think that's the right thing, the right direction. Uh, again, tying the designer community to manufacturing and doing it through uh, as easy a way as possible. Um, you know, ordering a circuit board is a pain in the ass. I know it. Um, but, you know, working together, we can make that better. So um, there's one other thing you could do in theory. Um, like, I don't know, you guys do it as well. Um, if you upload it, you get a rendering actually, and usually uploading is like, I don't know, it takes a minute. Um, if things are not there, usually they're not gonna be manufactured. So it's a little imp more implicit, but it's a little workaround for not having a design rule check. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's, we see a lot of people use it. I use it myself. Um, you know, we preview the Gerber layers when you upload it, and having the Python API makes it easy for us to be able to, to do that. People can just upload their KiCad file directly. So hit save in KiCad and upload it, and you can view it and you know get kind of a feedback cycle there. Yeah. So giving a guarantee on those renderings is actually not a bad idea for vendors, I think. So. Um, <clears throat> so about uh, five, ten years ago, if I was making. It, uh, if I was making an assembly, I would uh, spend a lot of time on the assembly drawing, making sure that a technician could read it and understand what parts are where. Um, and that was mostly because technicians had no access to software. It's just no one would buy them something to look at the files. Um, is that changing? Do, you, uh, do the people on your factory floor, do they have access to a, uh, the KiCad software? Um, or our paper, I don't know if this is a false dichotomy, or is a paper uh, assembly drawing with a, an eye for you know, a technician reading, is that still valid? <laughs> that's, that's a hard one to unpack. Every factory is going to be a little bit different, but um, I would say uh, the cost of computing coming down so rapidly, now every single person in our factory has a computer. They're not doing any work without a computer in front of them. So all of our documentation is digital, and uh, depending on your staff, you can train them to, um, to interact with KiCad. We uh, haven't done that. We haven't gotten to the point where we've taught our people how to use EDA software, but uh, if you do include uh, drawing and or many drawings, uh, we will absolutely make that accessible to the people doing the manufacturing. That will be, that will be viewable by everybody involved in the process. Um, it, but it may just be a PDF rather than the actual EDA tool itself. You're gonna see that on a tour through FAPS, by the way, how they're working. Like they have a huge operating manual usually that goes along any order. So, <laughs> and, and after this, if anyone wants a brief demo, I'm working, we have like an MVP for an augmented reality tool that we're going to be using for assembly. You could see it through a lens, it's pretty crazy. So if any of you guys want a quick look at that to help you with your debugging, I, I'd be happy to show you. Do, do that after my talk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's augmented reality. Yeah. Thanks. Um, another question on China again. Do you, no matter if it's for the assembly houses or for the board houses, have any clue why Shiner is actually so cheap? <laughs> so it, we are speaking like for, for some PCBs like a uh, factor of so, half the price or even quarter of so, the price. Where, so, is, where is this coming from? So I don't know how many of you guys were in my talk yesterday, but I kind of briefly went over why PCBs cost money at all. And a big part of that is labor. 
you did the quick tour of the factory, you see how many hands a panel has to touch, whether it's a two layer or a 10 layer board. And all those hands have a labor cost associated with them, especially if you're in California or even the United States in general, to run a factory and run a business of that scale is incredibly expensive. Chris can tell you, Ama can tell you, same deal. In China, those labor costs are far different. Also, there's incredible subsidies there from the government, and the way they do JLC and PCBA in the back end <laughs> is also up for debate, but whether or not those are being subsidized on a different end, you know, TVD. But if you actually, like with Eisler and Oshpark and these other guys, if you actually add up the same spec, like you're using TG170 versus TG120, if you're using Enig Finish versus Hassle, if you want your boards in a reasonable amount of time and you're not paying for this over crazy expensive shipping, the price actually is a lot cheaper to manufacture here in the United States from these high-end vendors than it is to go directly to China if you're comparing apples to apples in the same spec. Yeah. But most people don't do that. Yeah, I was going to say um, a lot of the deals that you'll see with some of the batch PCB services from, from outside of the U.S., um, you know, usually they have a, uh, kind of a lower spec than what, like we have a default of ENIG and uh, higher level TG. So that doesn't matter to some people, um, but our, some of our customers care about having uh, lead-free uh, boards, um, so gold finish, and then also being able to handle lead-free re refill temperatures. Um, so kind of like our default, so we're maybe a little bit more than some of those other deals, but our default's kind of a higher spec, and, and uh, if you were to kind of do the equivalent pricing, it, it tends to work out about the same. I, I think you'd be shocked on, uh, as far as the assembly side is concerned, how much cheaper the exact same parts are overseas. So the same Panasonic ERJ resistor is gonna be less expensive in China than it is in the United States. Okay. A tiers of markup, <laughs> why, tiers of why, markup. Can you explain why that is, please? Uh, the distribution and, and um, you know, yeah, not, not to throw DigiKey under the bus, certainly not. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, so they could probably explain this far better than I can, but there's a whole supply chain in between uh, and before me, the assembler, gets it in my hand, and everybody's got to get paid in between. Uh, China's costs in between are all much lower. They have the same systems, but their costs are much lower, so the assembler can buy those parts cheaper. Um, ask those guys later, <laughs> they'll tell you. Um, so we have the design part of it, we have the fabrication part of it, and we have the assembly part of it. For us, some of the stuff that we've done has required um, the assembler to test the part as well, uh, which includes part of um, uh, you know, the firmware flashing and that sort of thing for certain chips. Um, I, I haven't heard that talked a whole lot about, and it seems to be a very hands-on manual process every time we want to get something like that set up. Uh, do you guys have any advice for us approaching an assembler to do that sort of thing? Is there any... Um, any kind of observations that you guys have had with working with other customers that require that sort of service? Is there any kind of standardization that goes along with that? Um, you know, it's, it, it is part of the process and, you know, anything that we can do to make your guys' job easier ultimately helps us out. So, any thoughts on that? So, I, I don't know if there's standards necessarily uh, to follow. Uh, there's best practices. And one of the things we like to say is, um, if you're going to have, most of the time the assembler is going to rely on you, the designer of the board, to create the test vehicle. Um, depending on the volume, sometimes a, a larger CM, we're, we're a small CM, but they'll, they'll have their own team that'll work with you to create the test vehicle. Uh, but most times we're going to rely on our customers to create the test vehicle, and we're going to ask them to make more than one, two, minimum two. Um, uh, that's a best practice to think about if you're, if you're going to create one. And generally speaking, most CMs aren't going to want to accept, uh, they're not going to want to do the testing until you reach a certain volume of, of boards. Uh, it doesn't make sense for them to train up their staff and all these sorts of things. And at the end of the day, it really is just a manual process. Somebody's got to sit there, plug this thing in, you know, watch it go through the process, verify everything works. It's, it's very, very manual. What I would recommend is you find an assembly shop that is specializing in prototypes and then use their first article service. So just try to get one built and fully assembled before the rest and have them hold off. You could test it up because it's the same thing as you going to the factory, do it with your own system, and then give them the go ahead if it's for testing purposes. 
Hi, so um, just kind of as someone who sees the fab process both in my professional and like hobbyist lives, um, a lot of the kind of jargon of the industry may seem kind of threatening to some people who are newer in the space. So like, I, I could tell you what ENIG is, I could tell you why you would wanna do like a uh, uh, chamfer on a board for a card edge connector or like a har special hardness or extra plating. But how do you guys see your role in defining those to people who are just coming up or communicating that someone's design might work better if they go for one of those options? I, I would say, I mean, that's kind of one of the core principles to, with the Hoshpark service is to make it really simple for someone to order their first board. So we want to kind of streamline that. That's one of the reasons why we, we just have a default and we don't really have any options. So it's, it's gold plating, it's a high quality substrate. So yeah. We try and limit the number of choices people need to make, um, and that really helps for someone ordering their first board. And yeah, I mean, um, giving you a sane default, I think, is always the best. And I guess you don't have to really compete with people that offer choice, because it's, it's a different business model. Because um, choice is always complexity, is always cost. So if you standardize, that makes things simple. So. Um, that's, I think, uh, the two different ways. Either you offer a lot of choice or you offer a standard at affordable costs because then you can standardize. Yeah, so uh, you should talk to your manufacturer, ask them questions. They'll give you an answer. Um, it's going to be more expensive to ask a question. But I'm, try I'm trying to make it easy to ask questions and cheap. But uh, my one, I'm going to say three things. Fab drawing, hugely important, even if it's a standard board. Assembly drawing, hugely important, even if it's a standard assembly. And if you have uh, like a BGA or any fine pitch components at all, go with Enig. And then there's like 100 other options uh, in custom circuit boards. And the best thing to do is talk to your manufacturer and get a good answer on what's the right choices to make. Hi. Um some of the biggest disasters I've had with um, PCB um, design and assembly have been from manufacturers helpfully fixing my <laughs> designs and not telling me about them and you get them back and you're like, well, the prototype from you worked but it went through a different person in the fab and they went, oh, you've got a little bit too tight tolerances there and moved it in a bit and now it doesn't work and things like this um, or like substituted parts or things like that. Um, how can you better solve those type of problems and um, like reduce this reliance on humans to improve things like yield and <laughs> that type of thing and do things the way we ask them to do? You want a simple answer? <laughs> sure. Uh, they won't. Um, as long as there's software around there that is called yield optimization in CAM, it will never ever exist and they will never tell you because that's their intellectual property to optimize yield. Okay, I have a little different answer. Um, <laughs> never overproduce is what they tell you. They will always overproduce and they will charge you accordingly. Okay, so my little different answer is that um, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. So. When you're manufacturing a circuit board, you sometimes have to put a UL marking on the board. And people designing RF, they, you know, they need a lot of uh, isolation, like no copper in this area. And when you have a human you know, trying to figure out where to put the UL marketing in copper uh, on your board, they're like, oh, look, a completely blank area where I can put <laughs> you know, copper, extra copper. And then they go slap it right there. So, um, yeah, so manufacturers uh, are not designers. So any instructions you can give to manufacturers to not make those idiotic mistakes would be, would be great. So, you know, if you say, um, you know, uh, any modifications to my Gerbers must be approved by me, it adds a step, but at least you should get back the manufacturing Gerbers that we're gonna use to build your product. Um, yeah, that's, that's the, what we do for all of our customers who ask for that. Okay, that has a price then. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing along the lines of that. I, I just want to say that I'm probably 10 times the price of Osh Park or anyone else. But, um, yeah, that's what it is. 
along, along the lines of that. So um, some manufacturers will want to substitute your caps and resistors and stuff for their own. So you have, if you include a note that says, you know, all substitutes must be approved by so and so, please email so and so. All uh, fab modifications must be approved by, and mo most respectable shops will honor that, honor that request. But it, it, that means you might get a delay in your order, right? Because the questions will come up where normally they'll make an assumption and they'll fix it, and they might be right because they see it a lot. Uh, so, but you might see delays in your order fulfillment because of that. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, thank all the manufacturers here and the manufacturer panel.